Ready? Well, welcome to Victorious Living, another night on Wednesday at Church of the Cross. We had some te technical difficulties, but we're on. Here we go. Well, welcome tonight. I'm very excited because tonight our title is The Defining Moment. Oh, my. You will want to buckle your seatbelt, sit tight, don't do a lot of moving around because we're going deep tonight. Anybody want to go deep? We have been studying the faith zone. We are learning with Father Abraham how to walk by faith. So we're, we're more than just ankle deep here now, folks. We're not just knee deep here. We're about up to our waist. Can you handle it? Yeah. I think you can. So I'm going to do I'm going to do some review so we can all get on the same page and then we're going to jump in. If you do not have a Bible, please make sure that you have a Bible app on your phone uh, because you're going to want that. Um, turn you're going to want to turn to Genesis 14. Um, however, I'm going to start reviewing in Genesis 12. So, so let's just refresh our memory, okay? In Genesis chapter 12, the faith journey begins as God gave Abraham some promises. You might remember what they were. God said, I will bless you. I will make your name great, says God. I will make you a blessing in all the people on earth. All the people on earth will be blessed through you. Now that's quite a promise, isn't it? So Abraham, who was brand new with his faith in God, left to a new land. Now as we went along with our journey, Abraham is growing in faith, isn't he? His mustard seed faith has developed, and his faith muscles are getting stronger and stronger. And we've learned that Abraham didn't always do it right, did he? But he got right back up. He learned his faith lessons well. And what a good example for us. Even when we mess up, we just get right back up and get back on track. So with that, and this is the part I love, I love that Abraham was imitating the character and mercy of Father God as he develops. That's what we should be doing. And as we grow and develop on our faith journey, we should more and more imitate the character of our Father. So Abraham knew, and it's interesting, even though he's got brand new baby-like faith, he knows strife is wrong. He knew strife, arguments, quarreling could not be tolerated, and we read that in chapter 13. So God, I don't know if you've noticed this, but God is a too much God. Too much. He lavishes his children. He's a too much God. So at one point, Abraham and his nephew Lot, God had blessed them so much that they had too much livestock for the land. And so Abraham and Lot were going to separate and gave Lot the choice of whatever land he wanted. Strife had entered the pastures and it entered their relationship. Now let me give you a definition of strife. Strife is fear wrapped in an angry package. Let me say that again. Strife is fear wrapped in an angry package. That's good, isn't it? So there's two causes the Bible mentions uh, or uh, Two causes the Bible mentions that cause strife. One is jealousy, and the other one is greed. Strife comes from a person who is never satisfied no matter what they have. Hmm. So Neph uh, Nephew Lot 
made some choices on the land he wanted to choose. And now that sets us up for chapter 14 in Genesis. You might remember, he chose the most fertile land and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. You remember Sodom and Gomorrah, right? So how many know this is not a good thing? Yeah, not good. So one thing that people don't realize, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that there is a protection in the faith environment. The blessing, the empowerment that comes from the faith influence. There's a protection. We need to stay under that influence to be blessed by God. But Lot, I guess he didn't know, he forgot something. He let go of the faith influence and that blessing and chose greed. So he didn't realize that all this time when all these blessings were going on, that he was a beneficiary of the blessings from God through Abraham's faith. So in Genesis 14, we learned that trouble was brewing. Remember, the door was opened by strife, right? Lot opened that door. Now war breaks out. Now if you're already at chapter 14, look at verse 10. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits. That doesn't sound good, I don't think. <laughs> and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Okay, so things were so bad that the kings ran off. Some fell there, which means some of the kings fell into the asphalt pits. And the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. They also took, as you might remember, Lot, who was Abraham's nephew, who dwelt in Sodom. And they took all his goods and departed. Here we go. Now, at this point, you might remember that Lot is a POW. Strife, greed, fear. That's never a safe place to be, is it? That's the devil's territory. And fear is the opposite of faith. But nothing touches Abraham with all this war going on. The faith man, he's prosperous, he's protected, he's kept by God. What a great place to be and stay. Mm -hmm. So he finances a military expedition. He attacked at night. He, Abraham, Abraham has had his own army. How cool is that? How cool is that that the man of God had trained his own army, and there was only 318 of them, but he had his own army trained, ready to go. So when Lot was kidnapped, he rose into, uh, into military speed, he attacked at night, defeated, and brought back all the goods, Lot, and all his stuff. What a good, good God. Now remember, our foundation scripture is 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Yeah. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. What is it? Our faith, absolutely. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes in Jesus, the Son of God? If you believe, you're already an overcomer. Amen. So let's pick up in chapter 14, verse 17, and let's get into this tonight. The king of Sodom went out to meet him, this is Abraham, at the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. After his return from the defeat of wherever that is, and the kings who were with him, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought up bread and wine. He was the priest of the God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, 
possessor of heaven and earth. Now this is where we're going deep tonight, but what I'm going to do is as I read the scripture, I'm going to break it down because it is so, so awesome tonight. And this touches us today. So the war was won by Abraham's faithfulness in Almighty God by only 318 men. So the king, the king, Melchizedek, came out to, um, to meet Abraham. Now let's think how odd that is. Because a king never comes out to meet anybody, right? No. He's the king. People come in to him and submit to him, right? But Melchizedek came out, and not only did he come out, but he brought wine and bread. It was often in those days that a king would have a dual role. He would be the king, but he would also be a priest. A priest would perform duties similar to a pastor today. Um, so a priest in the Old Testament similar to a pastor. So we know already that this king knows God, the only one and true God. So we are going to learn, as he brings his bread and wine, we're going to learn that there is so much symbolism from the Old Testament that applies to the New Testament and applies to us in these passages tonight. So if we don't read carefully, and we zoom right through, and I don't know about you, but when I've been reading the Bible through from cover to cover, do you zoom through some things? Yeah. I know. So tonight we're not going to zoom through. We're going to take it line for not line, break it down, and understand what this is about because this is amazing. So we don't want to miss any of God's teaching here, do we? So Melchizedek is also mentioned in the New Testament. Melchizedek is a symbol of the coming of Jesus Christ. Is that pretty fabulous? Yeah. Did you get that? Should I say it again? Okay. Did you take a quick nap? There's no time for napping tonight. We've got to stay with it. <laughs> Melchizedek is a symbol of the coming of King Jesus. He's coming out to greet Abraham, symbolizes Jesus comes to meet where we are. In the middle of the battle, whatever, in the middle of whatever we're dealing with, it's seeking him and his presence. That Jesus always comes and meets us at the point of our need and pain. Have you found that to be true? Yes. Yeah, me too. So King Melchizedek brings two very important elements that we know very well, the bread and the wine. It is a significant symbol of communion, right? That we emphasize and partake of in the New Testament. Bread symbolizes the body of Christ, the body that um, was broken on the cross for us, the wine symbolizes his blood that was shed. Jesus sacrificed, and we are to remember that sacrifice until he comes back to get us. Jesus, come quickly. Mm -hmm. So King Melchizedek comes out and greets Abraham. And what is cool here is the king is in awe of Abraham. He's in awe of what Abraham has done and what he's accomplished through his God. And he's coming out and wants to bless Abraham. Now that's a big deal because he's the pastor, right? He's the priest. But Abraham here does something very, very significant. He gives one-tenth of everything that he got from the spoil of war to the priest. He gives his tithe. Did you pick up on that? He gives his tithe 
Remember we said all the stuff that the kings from Sodom and Gomorrah, all the goods, all the goods of Lot, all the stuff. Well, Abraham went and took it all and gave one-tenth of it to the priest. Now, considering in this war was five countries, it must have been a huge pile of loot. What do you think? I think so, too. So the king tries to get Abraham to, get, to, to keep it, keep the stuff. But Abraham says this to the king, and we're going to start with verse 20. And the king says, And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And Abraham gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons, the prisoners of war, and you take all the goods for yourself. Verse 22, but Abraham said to the king, I've raised my hand to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will, listen closely, I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I've made Abraham rich. Wow. Wow. Isn't that amazing? He said, I won't take a thread. I won't even take a strap from your sandal. I know why I'm standing here. God has made me rich. And that has nothing to do with you, Mr. King. He was making sure God would get all the glory. Can you see that Abraham has learned his lessons well? Isn't he doing great? He knows God is his source not King Melchizedek, not anybody else. All praise and honor goes to God. What a faith lesson for us. Mm. So now let's transition to chapter 15. We're moving right along. And this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time tonight. And we're going to break it down because there's so much meaning in this chapter. And if you have read chapter 15 before, you, as well as me, might have looked at it and went, huh, I don't get this. Well, we're going to get it tonight, okay? It may initially sound a little confusing and too deep, but hang on. You can handle it. Because what we're going to do is we're going to pray right now and ask the Holy Spirit of God, the divine teacher, to teach us. Okay, let's pray. And I want you to lose your faith uh, as I pray as well. Father, in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, great teacher, you be the teacher tonight. And may it fall on fertile soil. In the name of Jesus, we receive what the Word says. We receive the meaning of the symbolism. And God, we want to get everything you have tonight and seal it up by the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I, I, I'm telling you, tonight is going to change your life. It's going to take your appreciation and your love for God to a whole nother, another level because we're going to understand together what a covenant is and what a covenant relationship means in our lives in our relationship with God the Father. So we're going to look at tonight the vision, the promise, the covenant, and the presence. Aren't you glad you're here? Aren't you glad? I've missed you. I missed you last week since we were off for Thanksgiving. So God again is giving Abraham's attention with a promise and a command. Let's look at chapter 15, verse 1, please. After these things. Now, when you read that, you want to know what things were after. You want to know what was that. After these things, what things? Well, it was everything in chapter 14 that we just learned, and there was so much in chapter 14. So after all of that, here comes 15. The word of the Lord came to Abraham 
in a vision, saying, Do not be, be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. So there's, there's three things here that are vitally important. Number one, God is saying, don't be afraid. Why would he be afraid? Because there's some things coming that are a little different. Don't be afraid. So he's telling him ahead of time. I am your shield. You know what that means? I'm your sovereign king. I am your shield. And here comes a promise. I am your great reward. I'm your greatest treasure. Now remember, remember what Abraham denied in chapter 14? He said, I'm not going to take anything unless it comes from you, God. Now look what God's doing. Turn down the king, but God rewards. God gets the last word with his children. Look at verse 2. But Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? You see, possessions don't mean a thing to Abraham. He's got a greater desire in his heart. The heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abraham said, look, you have given me no offspring. offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. So he's saying, okay, God, you're my sovereign king. You're my greatest treasure. But look, what I really want is a son. I'm going to have to give all of my goods, all of my wealth to my servant because I have no children. So let's just remember, let's, let's go down memory lane a little bit, shall we? In Genesis 12, 7, God appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. But remember, we said Abraham didn't get it. He didn't respond. It was a little too heavy for him. He didn't get it. And then in 13, 15, for all the land you see, I give to you and your descendants forever. Your descendants as the dust of the earth. And it said they can't even be numbered. Again, he didn't get it. Because this is too big. Abraham still had his faith training wheels on. He didn't get it. But now, I, do you think he's ready? Do you think maybe he's ready to hear what God has to say? God has a plan for us. But you know, we can't always comprehend it. And I love how gracious and merciful God is. He just will draw us as many pictures as we need for us to get it. If we don't get it the first time, he knows us. And don't ever say, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to miss it. If you want it, you'll never miss it. Because God, I mean, seek and you'll find, right? So God is going to be patient with us because he knows sometimes we're a little dense. <laughs> we don't always get it. God knows that. And if we are obedient, he is always patient and kind. So let's look at verse 4 and talk about the vision. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir. Who is that? That was Eleazar, the servant. He's not your heir. But one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Wow. Wow, God. God needed... A visual. You know, I told you sometimes we need God to draw us a picture. So did Abraham. So what God did is he painted him a picture to understand the promise. So God took him outside. Look at verse 5. Then God brought him outside and said, Look, look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. That sounds familiar. God had said that before. And 
Are you ready, verse 6? Abraham was ready. His faith was stronger. His faith muscles were all pumped up. And he believed in the Lord, and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Amen. Wow, that's big, that's powerful. Abraham believed. You know that's necessary for faith, yeah. right? Abraham believed. So what kind of faith lesson is that for today? Well, let me give you some examples. Because God gives us promises in his word. We just have to believe them and receive them. For example, in his word is the promise, by his stripes you were healed, but you still see sickness. What about God delivers you out of all your troubles, but the problem is so big you can't see the answer. What about God meets all my needs, but the bill is still unpaid? What about great is the peace of your children, and that child is still in rebellion and far away from God? God is making a promise, and we need to do like Abraham did in verse 6, and he believed the Lord. Sometimes we just need to say, I believe I receive. God is too big for me. I can't comprehend it all, but your word says it, and I believe it, and that settles it. Amen. Amen. So let's look at the realities here. Now, this is a great story and a great promise, but here's something really cool. Abraham is 85, and Grandma Sarah is 75. Do you see a problem there? <laughs> Does it look impossible? Yes. yes, it does. And she couldn't have babies when she was of childbearing years. And now she's a grandma. So what we need to say is, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I believe. No matter what it looks like with our physical eyes, it's really, really ministered to me today. I'm sure it's ministering to you too. This is the life of faith. Believing when you can't see it. Believe in the unseen. But we have to believe in our heart before we can believe it, or before we can see it with our physical eyes. Look at verse 7. Then God said to him, I am the Lord, who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So God continues to give a promise to Abraham, but then here comes another visual. In the remainder of chapter 15, we see God revealing to Abraham his true character, his un unconditional love, the promise of his love, the promise of his presence, and God in chapter 15, as we walk through it tonight, remember in verse 8, Abraham is asking a question. The remainder of chapter 15 is God answering the question. His question was, how, how can I know that I inherit these things? So God begins to show Abraham the meaning of covenant. Fasten your seatbelts, okay? We've been working up, working up, working up to this, and here we go. There is a moment when the reality of our messy circumstances, anybody got any messy circumstances? Oh my, I get ya, I get ya. There is a moment when our messy circumstances, our messy life collides with the promises of God. Did you get that? There is a time when our uh, the reality of our messy circumstances collide with the promises of God, and it is the defining moment in our life. That's when faith ignites, and believing turns to receiving your miracle and your needs met. Did you get that? 
when those two collide and we have that defining moment, then that's when faith ignites, believing turns into receiving your miracle, and your needs are met. Do you like that? That's a mouthful, I know. Did you get that? Yes. You may not feel it at the moment, but I'm going to show you the covenant of God Almighty. And that's what is ready to happen to Abraham. It's his defining moment. And if you will listen and if you will engage tonight and really get this, and if it sounds hard to say, Holy Spirit, teach me. Holy Spirit, teach me. I open up my mind. I need to get this. It's going to be your defining moment, too. And we're going to learn that God is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. God's whole relationship with us is all about covenant. It's all about covenant relationship. And if we don't understand covenant, then we don't understand our God. Abraham, with his faith on training wheels, needs to understand what making a covenant and keeping a covenant is and what it means to God. So God begins to answer the question that verse 8 says, and he's going to answer it by covenant. Abraham saying, how can I know? And God's going to go through a visual with him. In his vision, remember he's in a vision. He sees all this in a vision. And God shows up and shows him. How can I know that my needs can be met and that, God, you're going to meet all the issues I have? Abraham needs to understand this, too. He needs to understand what relationship means. And, excuse me, in a relationship, there's two parts. There's our part and there's God's part. We need to understand that once we come into covenant with God, it changes our relationship with the Heavenly Father. And it's going to take it to a ne another level, and it will be your defining moment, too. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to go to another level with God? Do you want to be more than just saved? Do you want more of a relationship, a partnership, a covenant believer? Because we can just be saved. Yeah, you know, we're, we're going to uh, make, it, uh, make it into heaven on a banana peel. Okay. But you know what's going to happen in heaven? If we don't learn it here, we're going to go to school in heaven. I'm serious. We've got to know these things. So I say, I want to know it here because I want my PhD and doctorate in heaven, right? Okay. So we want more than to be just saved. So let's learn together, shall we? All right. I'm going to try to get through this. We only have a few more minutes. Actually, we've got 20. So I'm going to try my best, okay? Okay. So you might be asking, what is a covenant? Because we don't hear that word real often, but we hear some similar words that maybe are more comprehensible for us. A covenant is a mutual understanding or agreement between two or more parties. Each of the parties are binding themselves together to fulfill obligations to fulfill binding agreements and promises to do or not to do. You've got your part of the agreement, I've got my part of the agreement. It's a pact. It's a promise. It's, it's an agreement. And the word covenant itself means to cut. And that's where we're going. All right. When there is cutting of the covenant in, in Bible times, it meant blood would be exchanged. Your blood would mix with my blood, and that was a, a covenant agreement. 
um, it's making a one blood together agreement. Covenant agreements are, and promises are made in countries, military, friendships, and marriage is a covenant relationship. There are nine covenants that God made in the Bible. They are so absolutely fascinating. We don't have time for all of that, but it is, it is so interesting. So as we begin to unfold, we're going to learn in our faith study, we're going to know through God's way what a covenant is. So what we're going to see begin to unfold is the Abrahamic covenant. It's a covenant that's being cut with Abraham by God. It's exciting. It was made with Abraham, and it was handed down to his descendants. Again, remarkable, because at this point in Abraham's life, he doesn't have a son, right? This covenant agreement is for his descendants. Does he have any? No. So it really is quite amazing, isn't it? It's a promise. So this covenant becomes even more impactful later in Abraham's life, and we'll learn more about that because he will literally be tested later in his life. When we understand covenant and we come to a greater knowledge of God, we will know him more. We will understand him better because of the covenant. As God answers the question to Abraham in verse 8, we see the covenant that God has begin to unfold as a promise. So we're going to look at verse 9. We're still in chapter 15. And we're going to talk about the covenant itself. And God said to Abraham, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought all of these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Okay, so does this seem a little odd? Yes. It might. Okay, we'll explain. Not when we begin to understand God's promises and teaching here will we begin to understand the unfolding of the covenant. So there are three basic things that constitute a covenant. One is words or promises, like vows and promises, like in a marriage ceremony. Does that sound familiar? Sure. There's also blood. Now, I'm, we're just going to be honest. We're all grown-ups, right? Okay. As God intended originally for the marriage bed, the ceremony, uh, the marriage bed after the ceremony, excuse me, blood is spilt as a result of the virgin and her husband. That's the blood spilling of the covenant. We will see how important this is and what God originally intended for a man and a woman. Makes sense, doesn't it? The importance of the marriage bed not to be undefiled. To be undefiled. So lastly, with a covenant, is a seal. There's a seal to seal it up. So God is starting the process of covenant with Abraham by bringing in a heifer, a goat, a ram, a dove, and a young pigeon. Now, everything in God's word has meaning. God's just not throwing in a pigeon and a dove and a heifer in here. All of them have meaning, and once we explain that, it's a wow factor. So why these different types of animals? Before the cross of Calvary and Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, as you might remember, people sacrificed animals, right? Their, their sins were just covered. Ours aren't just covered up, are they? They're gone, they're erased. But in Bible, in Old Testament times, they were covered, a symbol of covering their sins. Now the rich would bring a heifer. The less rich would bring a goat or a sheep. 
those that were poor, a dove, and even more poor, a pigeon. Interesting. So I like this about the covenant because God left no social status out. It doesn't matter how rich, how poor, there is an availability. There is, um, no one could say, well, I can't afford a heifer, so um, I guess I can't do it. Well, pigeons were plentiful, so they could just go grab a pigeon anywhere, I suppose. <laughs> but folks, nothing is left out of the cross either, right? Everybody comes, no matter what their social status is, when you come and say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, I need you. He meets us right where we are. No matter what level we're at, no one is left out. You come right as you are, and all are come to Jesus. Amen. Amen. So here's the scene. Remember, it's a vision. So they've got a heifer cut in half. They've got the goat cut in half. They didn't cut the birds in half because they were too little, but they did put them on each side, and there's a reason for that. Part of the covenant agreement is one person has promises to keep, and the other person has promises to keep. Thus, word and agreement, okay? For example, if you don't come into agreement with it, then you're not going to get the blessing of it, right? Okay. Also, if you don't come into agreement and don't have faith for it to be obedient, then there will be curses involved. So we've got two halves, my part and God's part, Abraham's part and God's part. Look at verse 12. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell over Abraham, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Abraham fell into a deep sleep. And my research resulted in similar to the deep sleep that God put on Adam. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I thought so too. God's presence is all over Abraham as they cut the covenant. Look at verse 13. And he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Is any of this sounding familiar? Yes. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So God is telling Abraham what's going to happen with his descendants. Pretty amazing. Now, we already know this because we've got the Old Testament. And we read Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We read all of that of what's going to happen. But he's telling Abraham this is what's going to happen to all of your descendants. Today, we have the Holy Spirit to do the exact same thing for us. John 16, 13 says, The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth, and he will tell you things to come. We're not supposed to be surprised. We're to be prepared if we're in tune to the Holy Spirit. He will tell us what's coming. Why? So we can be prepared. We can be prayed up, not caught off guard. What a good, good father. So remember we said that the animals cut in half are a sacrifice. Now we've got the presence of God on the scene. Look at verse 17. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, that behold there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. God's walking between the two pieces of the cut animals, the covenant. God is walking through and cutting the covenant with Abraham. The fire pot, the torch, is God's presence on the scene. He's walking through the covenant with Abraham. To bring it to present day, 
we are walking in agreement. And it's like walking down the aisle in a marriage ceremony. I think that's so interesting. In verse 17, we see we're keeping the covenant of God. And when the lamb went through, it was a symbol of Jesus walking through, keeping the covenant and the spiritual seed of Abraham. Who's the spiritual seed of Abraham? Oh, let me read that to you in Galatians 3.29. If you are Christ, anybody in Christ here tonight? Woohoo! If you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Can you say Yahoo? Yahoo. Yeah. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham. Wasn't that just so, calm, so cool? So in verse 18, we see the covenant is made. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. This promise is for Abraham's descendants. Remember, he doesn't have any. But God is a faith God, and you can trust him. And in Romans 4, 17, it says this, Call those things that be not as though they were. This is what God's doing all through this. Does Abraham have a son? No! But God is calling descendants, saying what the numbers will be, saying that they're going to own this land, and this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. God is calling those things that be not as though they were. Just like he did back in Genesis, 1, uh, Genesis chapter 1, when he said, let there be light, because there wasn't any, he called those things that be not as though they were. God is a faith God. You and I should be calling those things that be not as though they were. When we begin to stand on the word of God, and stand on that scripture for our healing, then we say, by his stripes I'm healed. I'm healed. Doesn't matter what I feel like, doesn't matter what it looks like, I'm healed. I'm calling those things that be not as though they already were, because in the spirit realm, they already are. And do that with your wayward child. Do that with that bill that needs paid, or, or whatever it is. Once you find the scripture, stand on the word, you call those things that be not as though they were. So Abraham, your offspring, your descendants, I'm giving them this land. What? No son? Well, God said you'd have, you'd have a son. And the promise is there. He's cutting the covenant. It's already done in the spirit realm. This is Abraham's defining moment. Did you get it? This is the biggest lesson, faith lesson, that we could get. So now let's make it practical, shall we? Let's make it practical, and, and I'm going to take you step by step. Um, we pray for a need, whether it's finances or family or job or health, whatever it is. We pray that the situation will change and we hang our hat on the scripture. That's your number one step when you have a need, an issue, whatever it is. You go to the Word and find the answer. It is our answer book. It's not the problem book. It's the answer book. So the first thing you do is you find where you, what your covenant father has said with a covenant scripture. Okay? Let's use the example of finances. That kind of suits everybody for the most part. Would you agree? So let's use Philippians 4.19 as our foundational scripture that we're going to hang our hat on. God said in his covenant, but my God meets all my needs, all my needs, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So I've gone to the Bible. I have found my covenant promise. That's it. So now I say, I don't say I don't have it. I don't have it. I hope it works. I say, 
Thank you, Father, it's done. Thank you, Father, you've met every need I have. Well, now I go to Romans 4, uh, 4.17 where it says, I'm calling those things that be not as though they were because that's faith. So I say, thank you, God, that you've met every need. Thank you that that bill is paid. I don't have a care. I roll it all onto you. Thank you, God. <coughs> what am I doing? I am getting in line with my covenant God, my covenant Father, who says he'll meet my needs. That's the part of the covenant that he said he would do. My part is to by faith receive and call those things that be not as though they were. Now I look at my circumstances and I don't let that shake me because even though that bill says to me, you know, you're due. I'm due at a certain time. You know, you've got to pay my bill. You know the bill is still outstanding. You don't listen to the bill screaming at you. You say, my God meets all my needs and I stand on the covenant of promise because I serve a covenant God. And he will always do his part and Father, I will do my part because I trust you. A covenant is binding. It's a promise. It says, I will bless you, that uh, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. The covenant partner's agreement is, if you can't pay your bill, then I will give you my wallet. That's a covenant partner. That's covenant. The Father is going to meet your need as long as we're in obedient, yes. Our part obedience, our part in the word, our part praying, we're doing everything we're supposed to do. Because remember, it's a twofold, two or more parties. So we can't do whatever we want, throw caution to the wind, and say, yeah, but God meets all my needs when we don't do our part. Remember, the covenant is binding, but both parties have to do their part. So we get in line with what God says that he will meet our needs. It's keeping and enabling God to intervene. He's our covenant partner. And I don't know if you know what he says he's going to do, he's going to do. Have you found that true? Yes. What God says he's going to do, he's going to do. God says, I want to make a covenant with you. I want to be your covenant partner. And I want you to know I will do what I said I'm going to do. You can count on it. And so we say, Father, I receive that part of the covenant, and you can count on me to love you, to stand on the word, to praise, worship, honor you. I will do my best with my part of the covenant. So we have learned that a covenant has three parts, words and promises, the blood of the covenant, and the seal. We'll learn more about that later. We are sealed by the promise of the Holy Ghost. We belong to Jesus, and we are family. Amen. So God comes into agreement with us. We are his. He is ours. We can take his promises and we claim them for our victory. We're family. And because we are a child of God, we have covenant rights. Now, there's a lot of people who don't like that. We should not say we have rights. Well, the Bible says we have rights. And that's not being arrogant. That's being confident in God's word. Some people would call that arrogance. It's not. We're confident in God's word, and we have covenant rights because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, God's son. And can I tell you that the contract to the covenant is signed, sealed, and delivered by Jesus Christ himself, and we are covenant people. So have you had a defining moment tonight? Yes. Have you realized what a covenant agreement is between you 
and your God. We need to get in relationship with the Father like it was intended. Look at, at the extent that God went through for Abraham. Because Abraham didn't have Philippians 4.19. <laughs> Abraham didn't have Romans 4.17. So God himself walked through the covenant agreement. Don't you love that? Have you moved closer in faith tonight? Can you agree with your covenant father that he's the impossible doing God? What looks impossible in your life tonight, God can do it. Because he's a covenant-making, covenant-keeping father. But the breach in the covenant usually is us. We break the covenant agreement because we don't do our part. How about, dear ones, we make a fresh and a new commitment tonight with our covenant father who went to such great lengths to give his son Jesus and Jesus walked through the covenant. It's the Jesus covenant. Let's close our eyes, shall we? Let's let this be a holy moment. And let's start out with, if there's sin in your life, if there's anything that maybe you've not been as close to God, got off the path, messed up, this is your time to say, Father, forgive me. And in Jesus' name, I'm coming back home. And then tonight, you learned a lot about covenant and relationship. You talked to God about being a covenant partner. I'm deepening my covenant relationship with you, Father. You're a covenant God, and I'm a covenant man or a covenant woman. And I'm drawing closer to you because now I understand. And I will do my best with my part of the covenant because, Father, your best is always there. Tell him that you love him. Thank him. Praise him. This is your defining moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, seal up our time by the Holy Ghost. And, Father, seal up the word tonight and bring it back to our remembrance throughout the week. We don't want to forget it. We don't want to get sloppy in our relationship with the Father because look what he did for us through Jesus. Thank you, God, for your word. Oh, my. We're in awe of you. Great God. Great God. We love you. Thank you, Jesus, and we appreciate you, Holy Ghost. And I ask a special blessing over my precious friends tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.